welcome to another Inbox segment. This is part 13, where I'll try and answer all your questions. There is a good response to the video I did on making the pixie slightly less appalling. One of my questions was for Michael McShan, who wanted to know if the pixie could be got to operate on 7.1 to 7.12 MHz. Apparently in the States, that's a popular segment for slower speed Morse operators and I believe also the technician segment of 40 meters. The good news is it can be if you use a 7.16 megahertz ceramic resonator. That can be pulled down, although you will sacrifice stability compared to if you're using a crystal. You will also need to experiment with capacitor values as well. Also, the inbuilt transmit receive frequency offset in the Pixie may not necessarily be accurate. And again, you might need to play around with some values. You will, apart from the ceramic resonator, need a variable capacitor, as well as a few other capacitors to ensure the tuning range is right for you. Another possibility, and this is something I would recommend even more, is to get two 7.122 megahertz crystals. That's a commonly available and cheap crystal frequency. If you put two of them in parallel, and then with a variable capacitor in series, along with a few micro Henry's worth of inductors, you'll be able to get what's called a Super VXO, a variable crystal oscillator that can be pulled over a longer range than the normal VXO. You may even get the whole 20 kilohertz you want from a 7.122 megahertz crystal. I have seen crystals for that frequency on eBay, or you might want to try expanded spectrum systems. Janet Winslow wanted to know whether I tried the LA3ZA modification to the Pixie. Apparently that improved front end overload performance, especially if you live near an area with strong AM broadcast stations. Well, your comment did provide the incentive for me to try, and it seemed to work, though in my situation it was hard to know for sure, because I'm not that close to a high power AM broadcast station, but those who are might want to give it a go. You can probably just search under LA3ZA and Pixie, and no doubt you'll be able to find the details of the modification. RPCOMS1 wanted to know how you swap the sideband for an SSB phasing transmitter. It's actually pretty simple. An SSB phasing transmitter has two audio outputs, both identical signals, except one is 90 degrees phase shift from the other. There's also the two corresponding inputs to the two balance modulators. What you do is you simply transpose the audio outputs, i.e. from this to this. IFL3 wondered about the loss of using non-copper material for antenna elements. This was in relation to the video where I used a pair of TV rabbit's ears as a transmitting dipole for two meters. Frankly, I don't think it's worth worrying about, particularly for an element that's only about this long. A couple of comments about my FM broadcast super regenerative receiver. Kevin Norris had difficulties in getting his going, and I must admit that super regen receivers can be a little bit tricky. The first thing I'd suggest, apart from the usual things like checking your wiring, is try substituting another FET. I think I specified an MPF-102. Even another MPF-102 may have different characteristics that causes it to work. I find, particularly as the frequency goes up, the predictability of transistor performance goes down and they start to lose out a puff. For instance, I have yet to build a successful super regen receiver for two motors, even though I've built them for six motors and the FM broadcast band. Dave M wanted a circuit for that two transistor SUPET receiver. I don't think I included it on my last Super Regen video, but I did have it on my first one. I think that was about three or four years ago, where I'm down at the beach listening to FM radio with a little Super Regen set. Only two transistors in a little lunchbox driving a crystal earpiece. I think it was based on a design that VK2ZAY found successful. Anyway, if you go into YouTube, search Super Regen VK3YE, you should get that video and the circuit. The video I did of various construction techniques 
particularly versus printed circuit board, continues to get some quite heated comments. For instance, Sinky J reckoned that anyone who didn't use other than a circuit board was really at room temperature IQ, or building circuits that aren't really serious electronics. I won't say anything about that, except to mention a lot of our viewers do electronics for fun, and not as a job. And that gives us the privilege of building stuff how we like, not how some employer tells us to do it. In one of my videos on kite antennas, VE3ZCV wanted to know if I'd used a helium balloon. Well, the answer is no. It's actually probably a bit windy to do it, and then there's the issue of the helium cylinders, the cost of it, and all that sort of thing. And if I inhale too much of it, it might make my voice sound like this. No, I don't think I'll be doing helium for any time soon, especially as a one-man portable operator. Maybe as a club event where there's several people involved and also a club to split the costs, it might be more worthwhile. Yep, I did make a mistake in referring to Over the Horizon Radar as the woodpecker. The woodpecker was the famous, or the infamous, OTHR operated by Soviet Russians during the Cold War. The radar I read here now sounds a bit different, and you're right, not quite like a woodpecker. Phil Island left a kind comment about my National GX3, a portable early 1980s AM, FM and shortwave receiver. Phil also has a YouTube channel and that's worth checking out if you want to find out more about the GX3 and some other retro transistor radios. The All About You video was a bit out of left field and caused a lot of people to comment who don't normally comment. Thanks for all the comments, really interesting to see who you are, where you are, how old you are, your interests and all that sort of thing. Hope to get more comments from you in future videos. A call 18, when watching the video of the receiving converter I did when converting 7 megahertz to 27 megahertz, so you could hear 40 meter activity on a CV, wanted to know whether that converter would also handle the transmit side as well. The answer is no, not as it's presented in my video. However, there are such things and they are called transverters. Similar circuitry, except you do need an extra mixer to mix the 27 megahertz with the 20 megahertz local oscillator to produce your difference of 7 megahertz, as well as a transmitter, amplifier and power amplifier chain. That's required because you're doing all the mixing at low power levels of maybe a few milliwatts, and you probably need three or four amplifier stages to get it up to a practical power level, like five or 10 watts. Mick Bradford wanted to know about my ceramic resonator regenerative receiver. And in particular, could you get extra bands out of them? The answer is yes, provided you've got a suitable ceramic resonator. VK5 EME mini kits, who I bought my 7.16 megahertz resonator from, also sells resonators for 7.2 megahertz, which gives you a slightly higher segment in 40 meters. There's also 80 meter resonators available, 3.5, 3.62, or is it 3.64, and 3.68. If you buy those and put them in the receiver, you'll be able to cover a fairly large slice of 80 meters as well. You might need to fiddle with some of the capacitor values to get the optimum frequency coverage that you want to achieve on it. But yet, the short answer is if you've got a ceramic resonator for it, you can change bands just by dropping in another ceramic resonator. Nick Hamster wanted to know what that program I was using on my mobile phone to give you a spectrum analyzer design when I was listening to regenerative receivers. The thing is called Frequency. It's only a few dollars and it's available as an app on an Android phone. It's an audio spectrum analyzer that gets you from zero to about 20 kilohertz. And I found it really useful with direct conversion receivers, audio filters and the like. Just turn on your mobile phone, hold it near your receiver, and you'll get a Spectrum Analyzer waveform. Andre Nomad, in the video I did on the ceramic resonator, receiver, and transmitter, wanted to know about the function of the spot button. I've noticed you've got an answer from one of our other viewers. Thanks for that. You gave a great answer, spot on. But for other people who are seeing this video, who didn't read the original answer, 
a spot button is so you can get the transmitter and receiver on the same frequency. In other words, zero beat your transmitter onto the receive frequency. The reason for doing that is if you come across a station who's calling CQ, you need to get yourself on their transmit frequency because that's what their receiver will be set up for. If you don't do that, they won't hear you, especially if they're using a narrow CW filter. Theo T wanted to know whether I get RF noise levels at the beach. You bet, have a look at my previous video where the noise was so appalling I couldn't hear any amateur signal at all. In fact, it was even worse than at home. If you're at a beach where there's not too many houses or power lines, then yep, yeah, that's sure to be a quiet location. But otherwise, you've got to pick your beaches carefully. Some are reasonably good, and others are so noisy that it's not worth operating from. One thing I haven't spoken about for a while is the Beach 4040 Award. There are basically two sections. You could either work 40 stations on 40 metres with a Beach 40 homebrew double sideband transceiver, or a kit equivalent like the MDT. I haven't exactly been overwhelmed by the rush of interest, but I have actually had one application for the Beach 40 Distance Award. Anyway, if you are interested in the Beach 4040 Award, there's still plenty of time to make 40 contacts or work a long distance station, or at least anyone you think is long distance, on the Beach 40. And you never know, you might get a nice certificate in the email. Just before we finish, there continues to be a good response to Minimum QRP, the QRP Kindle ebook that tells you all about operating antennas, strategy, and more. To find out about Minimum QRP, visit my website, vk3ye.com, or have a look in Amazon and search Minimum QRP. Well, this has been a quick and lazy inbox segment part 13. Keep your questions flowing, and you can either ask them in the comments below or at the end of future videos.